Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I'm on a plane this Friday for a Saturday event in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. It's the Shift to Reason conference. And yeah, there are still tickets if you want to go. Shifttoreason.com. Next week, I'm talking to Alex Jules in a show that I'm calling Race and Religion in the Year of Donald Trump. Alex is the president of Black Nonbelievers of Dallas, Texas, and a former Christian, a former evangelical believer who has a lot to say on these issues. Had a chance to talk to him in Dallas, Texas. We sat down, did an on-camera interview. The audio of that exchange is the show next week. Also coming up in May, going to be talking to Tracy Harris, Ed Swalmanen has written another short story specifically for this radio show. You'll remember, I think it was last summer. We did Abraham's Excellent Adventure. It's kind of short form audio book, right? And everybody seemed to really love it as we retold and reframed the Abraham and Isaac story in a contemporary setting using some, let's face it, more honest language about what it's like when a father is told by the voices in his head to sacrifice his own kid. And you can find that show in archive. It's called Abraham's Excellent Adventure. Well, Ed just finished a new story that I'm reading on the radio in the month of May. I think the second or third Tuesday, it's called The Stone of Tribulation. And once again, it's something I would love to see find its way to the ears of Bible-believing Christians as they hear you know, some of this stuff that they normally kind of heard in these happy, clampy verses all of a sudden come to life in three dimensions in full gory detail. So that's coming up later on in the month of May. Tonight's broadcast talks about religion and the mind. How do we believe? Why do we believe? What are the processes in place? We're going to talk to three mental health experts on the broadcast. We'll kick it off here in just a second. Our broadcast tonight is brought to you by a very special sponsor. It is Casper. Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by knocking out the cost of resellers and showrooms and shipping their one-of-a-kind hybrid mattresses directly to your door. When I say hybrid, I'm talking about Casper's premium latex foam and memory foam. It's the kind of thing that another brand might charge thousands upon thousands of dollars for, but you can get with Casper for much less. 500 bucks for a twin size, 950 for a king. Now compare that to the industry average with premium mattresses. And instead of lying on a showroom mattress for three minutes before you commit to the mattress you're going to sleep on for a decade, right? Casper has a 100-day risk-free trial and easy return policy. Plus, you can get $50 toward any mattress purchase when you visit casper.com slash Seth Andrews, and then you use my name as the promo code as well. Premium mattresses for a fraction of the price made in America. A hundred days to try it out and free shipping to your door. That's casper.com slash Seth Andrews, promo code Seth Andrews. Tonight's broadcast is a panel of mental health experts to talk about religion as a virus of the mind. Dr. Andy Thompson is a psychiatrist, a trustee for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. He's on staff with the University of Virginia. He's author of the book, Why We Believe in God, A Concise Guide to the Science of Faith. Dr. Valerie Tirico is a psychologist, a columnist for Alternet, and she is author of Trusting Doubt, A Former Evangelical Looks at Old Beliefs in a New Light. And then finally, Dr. Daryl Ray, a frequent guest on this show. He's a psychologist. He's co-founder of Recovering from Religion, and he's author of the books The God Virus and Sex and God. Daryl's also host of the Secular Sexuality Podcast. And all three join me tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thanks for the invitations. 
Let's start with some background on each of you. I've got some new listeners, obviously, since we've had all three of you on the radio individually, but never as a group. I'd like to do kind of an introduction. Who are you, what you do, what your background in education is, what's the fire in your belly kind of thing. And I'll start with you, Daryl. You want to kind of give us a brief synopsis of Daryl Ray real fast? I've been a psychologist, organizational psychologist, and clinical psychologist, counseling psych off and on in various capacities for 35 years, and uh, author of several books, The God Virus, Sex and God. But uh, Passion in My Belly is uh, the organization I founded uh, six years ago, Recovering from Religion and, and the Secular Therapy Project, in which we're trying to help people deal with the trauma of recovering from religious indoctrination. What do you mean by trauma? I mean, what are we talking about? Well, most of the people that come to Recovering from Religion are dealing with something pretty difficult. They're dealing with getting divorced because their spouse still believes and they don't. Or or they raise their children religious and now they're atheist and they don't know what to do and they're afraid to lose the relationship with their children. And any number of these things can be traumatic or are traumatic. And we just want to be there to support them. We want to be there to give them an ear to listen and uh, to share with other people. We've also spoken about The need for therapy out there that's not religiously motivated, and I'm sure the other two guests on our show can speak to that as well. There seems to be a group of therapists who like to bring a personal religious belief. You know, healing comes from above. They bring that into their practice. And so you have an organization that helps people filter that out and actually get science-based health care, mental health care, correct? Right. We're at seculartherapy.org. We have 260 therapists that are certified secular and uh, use evidence-based methods in their therapy practice, which is really a, a difficult thing to find in a community. There's a lot of therapists out there that don't use evidence-based methods. There's therapists out there that don't even believe in science, but they are certified psychologists or marriage and family counselors, uh, family therapists, that sort of thing. It's insidious how many religious therapists there are out there that appear to be secular and, and really aren't. Sincerely believing that in order to be truly healthy mentally, you must be healthy spiritually, that kind of thing? Yeah, if Jesus cured mental illness, though, he would have done it 2,000 years ago. And we still haven't seen that. It's only science is helping us cure depression or bipolar or schizophrenia, you name it. There's no religious cure for any of those things. Valerie Tarico, I shared part of an article that I think you had on Alternet just a few shows ago. We were talking about why people believe weird things and how mainstream belief is no less weird than the cultish beliefs of these sort of you know, Scientology and those types of things. And I'd use the article that you'd posted, which quoted from the major religions, Christianity, Islam, a few others, specific stories many people hadn't heard of before. And then, of course, at the end, you spill the beans and show that, hey, this stuff is actually in mainstream religion. You've done a lot of writing and research on this kind of thing, right? I have. I've been writing for almost a decade now about a variety of issues related to religious fundamentalism, the role of women in society, and then more briefly focusing increasingly on family structures and family planning and trying to figure out how we can kind of accelerate the transition to kind of healthy families that don't necessarily have an Iron Age structure to them. And that includes being able to decide when and whether and with whom we bring children into the world. But with regard to the belief systems that you're talking about, One of the things I like to say is that our sense of reality is socially constructed. And although that isn't entirely true, as, you know, for example, I think people's experience of falling on the ground and having it hurt isn't necessarily a social experience, but there are lots of other kinds of ideas and thoughts that we formulate about the world around us that clearly come from our broader social context because we're social animals. And many of the mainstream religious beliefs would in fact be considered mental illness if they didn't have a broad social context of support. Is it mental illness or is it simply an embracing of bad ideas? You know, is it a defect in the mind or is it a conditioning based on family, culture, geography, those types of things? Well, you know, I sometimes think I differentiate in my own mind psychopathology, which has a biological basis, and maybe, I don't know, you might call this a sociopathology in the sense that 
religious beliefs of certain kinds can be every bit as detrimental. They can be every bit as intractable or non-negotiable as something like schizophrenia. And yet the cause isn't a, a malfunction in neurochemistry. It's a malfunction what we're talking about, a kind of viral ideology in the social context that then causes people to adopt beliefs that sometimes don't serve them well. Mallory Tirico is a psychologist. What does a psychologist do? Psychologists do a lot of different things. The kind of psychologist that I have been, a counseling psychologist, works with people to develop insights into the causes of their own behavior and um, and their emotions and feelings and to be able to identify alternatives to feelings and behavior patterns that aren't promoting their own well-being and the well-being of people they love and are trying to be in relation with. And so, you know, for me, that's meant a lot of years of doing therapy. It's also meant that that perspective then informs the writing that I have spent my time focused on in more recent years. Dr. Tirico is author of the book, Trusting Doubt, a former evangelical looks at old beliefs in a new light. I'm going to come back to that. Dr. Andy Thompson, want to give us some quick background on who you are and what you do? Uh, Certainly. I'm a psychiatrist and did my medical training at University of Virginia, then did my psychiatry training at University of Virginia and have stayed connected with the university and in Charlottesville ever since. And I was not particularly religious and what religious beliefs I had sort of went out the window with medical school and seeing human suffering. And I really didn't pay much attention to it until 9-11. My son was working in the building next to the World Trade Center on 9-11 and obviously came perilously close to being killed or seriously injured. And that got me interested in suicide terrorism, in my way of coping with it. And in researching suicide terrorism, I discovered all the literature that was out there, even in the early 2000s, on the mechanisms that the mind uses to generate religious beliefs. And I was stunned that this knowledge was not more widespread and more available. And so I got involved in the secular movement and ultimately the Richard Dawkins Foundation. And in 2011, I think, 2012, published Why We Believe in God's A Concise Guide to the Science of Faith, trying to put into a small book the basic psychological mechanisms that we use to generate religious beliefs the mechanisms that, in a sense, are hijacked by the cultural virus that is religion. That's an interesting way of putting it. There are mechanisms in place that are sort of co-opted by religion. Do you want to go a little deeper there, help us understand what we're talking about? Certainly. What I'm saying is, to some extent, connected with Daryl's ideas and other people's ideas, that the religious beliefs arise from basic mechanisms that were originally designed for other purposes and then those religious ideas those beliefs in a sense come back at us and hijack those mechanisms in ways that were not originally intended and i think one of the easiest ways to illustrate it is the attachment mechanism all of us are attached to our children our children are attached to us It's the basic mammalian attachment mechanism to a caregiver, and it's crucial for us and our survival. And so religions create caretakers, they create supernormal caretakers, they utilize that attachment mechanism. And the caretakers that we create in our religious beliefs come back at us in a more intense stimulation of that attachment mechanism. The gods we create are more powerful than any parent that we've ever had. And that's just one of many mechanisms that the mind has that evolved originally for other purposes. You speak like a psychiatrist, you know, it's strange. (laughs) Yeah, well, I apologize. (laughs) No worries. That's why you're on the radio. Daryl Ray, you want to jump in at all? I just want to say one of the most amazing presentations I have ever seen 
was Andy. I, I'm not sure if it was 2009 or 2010. It was New Jersey, I think. I had never met Andy before. And I hear somebody's giving a talk about how religion propagates and it's cultural phenomena. So I go to watch this and there's 600 atheists in the room. And by the end of his talk, he's got 600 atheists singing a, a religious song. I, what song was it? It's Amazing it? Grace. Um, 600 atheists singing, holding, holding arms and swinging back and forth, singing Amazing Grace. And I'm sitting here thinking, wow, he has just illustrated his point to the nth degree. Uh, my hat is off to you, Andy. You now, ever- what was the point? Is it the power of communal worship, communal experiences or what? Well, it's very, thank you very much, Daryl, because I, I would add in here, I think Daryl's books are the ones that I would have in place of the Gideon Bible in every <laughs> hotel room in the United States. Religions are very powerful because, again, they capture things that are crucial elements of our mind-brain. And what I did in that talk is to illustrate the power of ritual. Basically, our ancestors found a way of using the neurochemistry of our brains in a powerful way to create bonding. Religion comes from the Latin religere, which means to bind. And religious rituals are powerful ways of supercharging certain chemicals in our brain that are used in bonding to one another. Religions solved a problem that our early ancestors had, uh, and the problem was how do we bond with non-kin? How do we create kin-like bonds with non-kin? And one way we do it is religious rituals. And what I do in the talk is I ask people to think about how they're feeling and then think about how they feel about somebody they care about but with whom they're in conflict. And then the third thing I do is have them pinch their skin on the back of their hand as hard as they can and to create as as much pain as they can. And then I ask people to stand, put their arms around the shoulders of the individuals next to them. So that's touch and then have them start swaying, which is rhythmical synchronous movement and then sing Amazing Grace. And I, I deliberately chose Amazing Grace because obviously the content is something that the the intellectual content of the hymn is something that atheists would object to. Um, But just have them sing four verses of Amazing Grace, and then after it's over, I have people then do it in reverse, pinch their skin, and it's harder to reach the same level of pain because you've shot up your endorphins. And endorphins, in addition to controlling pain, endorphins also are a bonding hormone. Then I ask people to think about how they feel about the person they're in conflict with. And most people find it a little bit harder to be annoyed with or angry with the person they're in conflict. And then the third thing, just their gut sense in terms of how they're feeling. And most people report a change in feeling, a more outward positive feeling. And so just in a a few minutes, you can demonstrate the fundamentals of ritual and how it alters our neurochemistry. Daryl Ray, Valerie Tirico, any thoughts on that? I think what we see here is that um, the mechanisms of religion that have helped people to kind of be in community with each other and help them to feel good in the past as they become, as the actual content of those specific religious beliefs becomes less and less aligned with what we know about the world around us. A belief or a practice that is adaptive in one context can become maladaptive in another context over time, right? So if you're a child in a war zone, having a defensive posture, kind of reactivity to loud noises, for example, might be something that saves your life. When you're, that child is now grown and is kind of sitting in an office or, you know, where there might is a jackhammer outside and has that same sort of cowering, flinching reaction, it's not adaptive. And, and, you know, and if the person's then trying to give a speech or perform some kind of medical procedure at the same time, you can actually see how something that works in one context doesn't serve us well in another. And I guess I think that way about a lot of, of the kinds of religious beliefs and practices that Andy described that there are many of them that evolved 
via natural selection precisely because they both serve the if you kind of think of religion as a meta-organism, perhaps they serve to kind of perpetuate that organism, the religion itself, but also they kind of in some way served us as host beings and that in a world that is increasingly complex, that is multicultural, where we now kind of have better ways to understand biology, physics, and then to kind of improve our lives based on those better understandings, religions, practices and beliefs that were once adaptive have become increasingly maladaptive and they what in fact what they do many of them is now anchor us to the iron age when we need to be moving forward Daryl Ray anything yeah. to add I well I totally agree with uh, Valerie I, this is this can be a pretty complex topic but I think the simple the simple thing that both of them are saying can be summed up in in the fact that we learn religion when we're very young in fact, if you don't get religion by the time you're, say, 12 years old, you're much less likely to get it later, and you're very unlikely to switch religions dramatically. You don't get a lot of Christians becoming Muslims or Muslims becoming Catholics, and those those kinds of dramatic switches don't happen very often. But And when people do uh, are raised with a religion, they tend to stick with something close to that. And that's the notion that you're getting infected with a religion at a young age, and you stay with that religion the rest of your life. Words like infected, host beings, yeah. is religion a virus? Well, Valerie used that term, and I, I agree with the term. It, it Religion is a meta-organism. It, it's, it exists above our brains, but but it depends upon our brains in order to perpetuate. And there's just such great parallels between biology and religion. It, it's, it's almost <laughs> compelling to, to look at the biology of, say, uh, oh, gosh, help me, guys, the bug that gets in the cat's brain, a uh, rat's brain, I'm sorry. Uh, a lancet fluke? No, and not the, the lancet fluke does it as well. Uh, yeah, toxoplasmosis? Yeah, toxoplasmosis, right. It gets well, it of course. Right. I mean, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> toxoplasmosis. I mean, everybody it's, knows that. <laughs> well, and a lot of humans have it in their system, but it gets in rat systems and, and literally changes their behavior. If you have ever had a cold, for example, that cold changes your behavior. It makes you sneeze because the cold wants to get from my nose to your nose. And sneezing helps the disease propagate from my nose to your nose. Well, when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door to knock on it, they're trying to sneeze on you. They're trying to give you the Jehovah's Witness disease. Or the Mormons, when they knock on the door, they're trying to sneeze on you. If you think of that, that's what's going on with religions. Religions can't survive if brains don't contain them. So brains are <laughs> brains are a place for a religion to survive, just like uh, your nose is a place for viruses to survive. And, and Re religion's a virus then? I mean, it's a disease? Do we go there with it? I'm only using it as a metaphor, and I try okay. to be real careful. It, it's a metaphor that works pretty darn well. Well, I think Valerie got close to it. I think it is a kind of social disease. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I think it's a cultural disease, a social disease. It doesn't have the same pathology of the cortex of the brain, say, a schizophrenia. Right. But I think you, you want to think of it as a disease. It is a unique phenomenon, so you have to try to approach it from various metaphors. And I think the metaphor of a virus is a good one. And it's, it's as if that virus, you know, we know viruses are made of DNA particles or RNA particles. And it's almost as if this cultural virus is made of some of our DNA, some of our RNA, and then it's a unique combination of that. And then it comes back and infects us. Right. And Which takes us to the chart that we often see in, if I may, lazier circles where people are just saying religious people are insane. Anybody want to speak to that? You know, religious people, they're all freaking crazy. I think, first of all, I will confess that I sometimes joke about religion being an STI, meaning a socially transmitted <laughs> infection. I do, too. I do, too. <laughs> um, that said, I want to come back. There's a difference between something being infectious and something being crazy, right? Or even pathological. So kind of what I tried to say earlier is that I think if you think of religions as a family of infectious agents or viral agents, that then kind of what seems clear is that some of them are comparatively benign. Some of them may even be symbiotic. 
I'm certainly not in a position to say that all religion, uh, every kind of single variant of religion is somehow less adaptive than non-religion, but some of them clearly are very pathological, right? And the example you gave of the poor Jehovah's Witnesses, right, who have been infected with a kind of specific set of beliefs and then have to spend their life energy going door to door trying to kind of get other people to believe the same thing instead of getting to be home with their children, instead of getting to be out in their garden, instead of getting to be just enjoying the wonder that is life. They're out saving souls because they're compelled to in the same way that that toxoplasmosis infected rat now has kind of certain behavioral compulsions, right? So is it crazy? It's not crazy in the same sense as mental illness, and yet it it can be just as harmful to the person who is the host. Right. I I absolutely agree. I like Valerie's distinction. I I think it is an important one because I think it's easy to just label people, but I think the social pathology component is really clearly different than the biological or the neurological stuff that Andy was talking about earlier. Well, tell me if I'm picking this up incorrectly, but what I'm hearing is in a more ignorant era of our species, religion was helpful. It gave us things that we couldn't get or didn't understand, where here in the 21st century, it's not helpful because now we have the science, now we have the ability to better explore these issues. It was great for us in the infancy of our species, but today it's really destructive. Is there any shade of that that's correct or that I misinterpret? I think that's right on target. Yeah, I, it, it, I think you want to you want to think of it, you know, think of us, think of the the four of us living on the savannas of Africa and we would be relatively defenseless and powerless and we would come together and we would be confronted by a world that we didn't really understand. And religions would provide us bonding, but religions would also be our biology, our cosmology, our physics. We would understand how the world came into being and why things happened the way they did. So it was also an original explanation, which perhaps reduce some of our anxieties and the harsh, dangerous environment that we lived. Well, what, but I think it's I think it certainly may have been helpful, but I think the evidence I think is overwhelming that it has outlived its usefulness and is a harm. Daryl Ray, were you want to jump in? Yeah, I did. I, I want to add something to what Andy's talking about. Because on the savannah, the most dangerous animal you're going to encounter is not a lion, it's another human being. And you want signs that tell you, is this person a part of my tribe or is it a person of a hostile tribe? And that tribal identity and uh, that religion brings a lot of value to trying to see who is friend and who is foe and surviving. So if a child is taught from five years old, anybody that has a a cross um, around their neck is probably friend because they're they're you know they're they're Catholic or something, <laughs> and anybody who has a moon and you know whatever the Muslim thing is that is enemy, then it's a real easy way to identify friend and foe. Just like the lion will eat you, a Muslim will kill you, or a Christian will kill you. These are easy ways to distinguish between dangerous things in your environment, and that's what humans are. I think we can go far beyond the savanna and the animal thing and really look at religion helps people identify their friend and foe within the most dangerous environment on the planet, and that's the social environment. Tribalism. Yes. Yes. And I would go back to something that someone was saying earlier. Sam Harris that was a neuroscientist, and in one of his papers, one of his investigations, he shows that religious beliefs go into that part of the brain that has to do with self-identity. Right. Um, so religion gives tribal identity, gives identity, and as Daryl was pointing out, it also utilizes our in-group, out-group mechanisms. We make distinctions between in-group, out-group, and, and it's a very easy way to define an in-group and a larger in-group outside of just my immediate kin. And so it, it utilizes a lot of different aspects of our mental life. Dr. Tarico, do you want to jump in? Well, I guess the one thing I was going to add is that I think it, it's important to kind of note that religion is not a unitary thing, but a, again, a family of things. So I think that it is possible that from the very beginning, there have been variants of religion that were more parasitic than 
symbiotic, right? That they simply, you know, kind of that people evolved kind of social mind viruses that weren't adaptive even in the Iron Age. They actually were harmful. And by the same kind of token, I would say, even though I tend to largely think of religion having a more malign than benign effect in our world today, especially given how much it promotes tribalism, it's quite likely that there are variants of religion and subpopulations of people for whom religion actually is largely adaptive. And then I guess there's also kind of what I think what Susan Blackmore said, you know, that she revised her view of religion as kind of from being a parasite to being kind of a symbiotic relationship simply because what we know is even religions that cause a lot of violence, conflict, tribalism, etc., and specifically the Abrahamic religions, also tend to increase the birth rate of their hosts. And so for her, as a kind of looking at it through the, strictly the standpoint of evolutionary biology, she's saying if something increases kind of the survival, the number of surviving offspring, then you can't kind of consider it all negative. Now, what we know about ourselves is that most of us aren't really interested in optimizing our number of surviving or maximizing our number of surviving offspring. We've got other aspirations that have to do with love and joy and wonder and living well rather than simply kind of producing the maximum number of person years. I think Valerie raises a, an illustration about how the virus may work in a way that's adaptive to the virus, to the religion. If I'm religious it, and I'm Mormon, it leads me to have more children, which may not be in my self-interest or in the interest of my children because the, the mm-hmm. virus leads me to behave in a way where I have 10 children where I really should probably only have two. I could raise two children much more generously and effectively than 10. So I think the virus can be reproductively successful, but not necessarily in my self-interest or in my children's self-interest. Dr. Ryan Cragen down in, I think he's University of Tampa. He's in Florida, sociologist, talks a lot about in-groups and out groups, he said something I thought was interesting. He said something along the lines of, and I'm sure I'm probably butchering this, but we won't allow someone in the out group to criticize even legitimately someone in our in group. In other words, we will rush to defend the asshole that's on the family tree <laughs> because they're on the family tree. They're part of our club. I can criticize them, but you cannot. Well, if this is true of religious belief, if our deity, Jesus or Allah or otherwise, is part of our in-group, how in the world do we approach this? How do we approach it critically if they're automatically going to put up the walls of defense and they're not going to be listening? They're going to be protecting. What do we do? And do you even agree with that assessment of the in-group and the ad-group criticisms? I don't know. I would agree with it pretty strongly. And I think we've so far... We've been kind of academic about this. I think what you're asking is how do we actually deal with the virus once it's there? How do you change minds if they're in a protective mode? Well, the first question, and I I always try to address this with people when they ask the question, is you have to get them, you have to not put them in that protective mode. You have to be careful not to put people into a defensive mode because you're not going to get anywhere with them. My saying is defensive people don't change because defensive people don't listen and can't listen. So as as secularists, if, and as a psychologist, I'm sure Valerie and Andy have seen this a lot. Your job to help people change means you also have to reduce or minimize the defensiveness they come in the office. You know, if they come in ready for loaded for bear, they're probably not going to be able to listen and, and self examine and change. Uh, Valerie actually has a really good talk on that, too. I saw her at Madison, and you talked a lot about that issue of trauma and change and. I'm sure you got a lot to say about that. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version here, Dr. Tarico. Well, so the Reader's Digest version is just simply that people, I mean, it's like being in therapy, right? People need to feel safe in order to be able to examine themselves. And so they have to be in a non judgmental context. They need to be in a place where they have a sense that other people have their well being at heart. And only then, I think are they able to self-reflect because otherwise if they're kind of defensive emotionally against you as a person, they're going to kind of instinctively be kind of defensive against whatever ideas are being brought up and discussed. Dr. Thompson, anything to add? I think it's the main task facing the secular world is 
you know, how do we help people get disinfected? How do we help people shift? And I think what we need more than ever are sociologists like Ryan, psychologists, uh, researchers who are willing to take on the, I think, substantial research that looks at what helps people change in this particular regard. I think Valerie's right. You can't argue somebody out of their face and you have to help them find some safe place where they can question it and struggle with it privately. That that seems to be one of the consistent themes in the people I've talked to who have shifted. But I think that's really one of the tasks facing us is uh, is the research that helps us understand the mechanisms by which people become disinfected or you know that we leave the virus behind and, and orient themselves towards a more enlightened approach to life in the world. Disinfected would be another potential show title. <laughs> I'm, the more I hear it, the more I think, well, that's that'd make for an interesting thumbnail for sure. Dr. Ray, I heard you jump well, in. You want to yeah, say I'll- something? Well, I think your listeners probably want some practical advice. What do we do? Yes. I've, got a, I've got Joe Blow as my best friend, and he's so religious. What do I do? And I guess the basic thing that I want people to know is be kind to people, listen to them, but uh, you don't have to put up with their craziness, their bullshit, their you know religious idea. But you don't. But you also don't want to confront them. You, the more you use a confrontational, aggressive approach to people, the more you put them on the defensive. If you just quietly listen, I've had so many people come back after reading, for example, the last couple chapters of The God Virus. I talk about how to keep people on the, how to not put people on the off defensive. And they said, just using some of those techniques, help me with my mother-in-law or whatever. The issue is you're not there to deconvert them. You're there to show you're human and listen to their humanity and focus on their pain. Focus on what they're suffering from. Focus on what they need. And try to circumvent or ignore the supernatural ideas. Whether they're supernatural believers or not, they're still in pain. And the most supernatural believer in the world still experiences discomfort and depression and pain. And the more you can just be sympathetic and and not confront. I, I use the example of the um, Exorcist. If you, <laughs> if you remember that movie. Mm-hmm. When the priest confronts this demon inside the girl, the the demon comes out and you see the girl's face change and her behavior change and she starts, you know, doing all sorts of crazy behavior. Well, if you look at the way people respond, when you put them on the defensive, that's the way they look. It it <laughs> it is it is remarkable. And I've had so many people because I actually show people in the book, how do you do this a little experiment with somebody on the plane next to you, you know, and just ask them to, about their faith and watch their whole demeanor change. And as the God virus comes out and starts talking to you, it's like the demon comes out and starts talking. Only it's the reverse. It's not the demon. It's the God virus. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Who was it who said? Uh, Sir Valerie's got some techniques about this. And what's uh, the, a manual for creating atheists? Dr. Um, Peter Bogosian. Peter Bogosian's Bogosian. book. I like his approach because it's low key. It's non-confrontational. I don't know that it's the best or worst, but it's certainly better than I see a lot of people using. I was going to say, you know, one thing that's kind of nice about people having these horrible, bigoted ideas about atheists is that it makes it kind of easy to mess with their categories, right? So if Christianity teaches that an atheist has no moral core, that an atheist is somebody who has no meaning in life, no purpose, no joy, no capacity for love, no capacity for generosity, and like literally all of those things are taught by some or another variant of Christianity, then you can mess with people's categories just by being out as an atheist and then being yourself, right? So being willing simply to say, I'm sorry, I don't believe that, or I used to believe that and I don't anymore, and then continuing to be yourself, that in and of itself messes with beliefs because part of Christianity's immune system is creating the perception that any sort of questioning is in fact unsafe and that the world outside is a world full of godless people who are then amoral or immoral or violent. You know, I mean, the kind of epitome of that sort of belief system is the Left Behind series, right? That's why so many of the more fundamentalist religions are very uh, much against uh, people going to psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers. Jehovah's Witnesses will disfellowship you for going to a psychologist. And you know, Baptists are pretty skeptical about And that's part of the reason why all these religious schools have been training their own therapists 
because they want they, they need mental health care, but they don't want it from a secular psychologist. They want it from a Baptist psychologist. I think at the very beginning of the show, when Daryl was bringing that up, or maybe it was Seth, you try to point out to people, look, if you need a coronary artery bypass operation, how would you feel if the heart surgeon started proselytizing or started talking to you about the importance of faith in the bypass operation he was going to do on your heart? I mean, you'd start to get anxious. And I think when you point that out to people, you know, do you want somebody who's trained and skilled in dealing with the emotional problem you're suffering? Or do you want to be proselytized instead of helped? Sometimes you can get through to people. Because I, I see people all the time who say, well, I want a Christian therapist. And I say, well, you know why? You've got X problem. Don't you want somebody who's skilled in that? I had someone say on a radio show years ago, and it's woven itself into the fabric of many conversations since, and I think it speaks to, in many cases, this movement's challenges with timing. I always say it's not enough to be right. We also have to be effective. Mm -hmm. So the time to go and say, you know, there's no evidence for heaven or an afterlife is not in the middle of a funeral service amid grieving family members after someone has just perished, right? And the listener said it this way. He said, my tragedy is not your soapbox. Being right on point of fact is not enough if we're in the arena of helping people and changing minds. We also have to be compassionate and we really have to work on our timing. Anyone want to speak to that one? I don't think any of us would confront somebody at the funeral of a loved one. Well, I know some I people think, who would, though. I mean, I know some oh, people okay. who are so adamant that if somebody said he's in heaven, they'd say, you know, there's no evidence. I mean, they would just float out of their mouth. Well, um, and who knows? There may be somebody at that funeral who's it, it would get their attention and might, you know, help them down the road. You think so? I think the you other, don't think they well, I think, double I think, down, batten down the hatches and, and just get well, good and You know, it might off. be a doubting teenager at the funeral and hear somebody say that you don't know and the teenager goes home and gets on the internet and well, I looks, think at some, looks at some Hitchens videos and <laughs> he starts to he starts to move away we don't but I, I think the point of it is people are different and when I talk to people who've left their faith it's usually there are many different themes I don't think there's just one and so I wouldn't say something at somebody's funeral but you know you never know well um, so, of course, the funeral, this is the most extreme situation, right? <laughs> like, but, and yet, even at a funeral, I think there is room sometimes to be who you are so that if somebody says to you, aren't you comforted by the fact that Aunt Jamie's now in heaven? I think it's okay to say, I don't believe in heaven, but what I do take comfort from is the fact that Aunt Jamie lived such a good life and she was so loved and we can look around this room and it's really obvious how many lives she touched. So I think that there are ways yes. to, again, what I was trying to say earlier, kind of own be out without kind of then having to go on the offense. Well, I, yeah, I'm not saying I agree with that. that no, you're, you're not true to yourself if someone approaches you and brings the conversation to you. I think that's a totally different thing than somebody, you know, walking yeah. in with you know Jesus giving everyone the finger on a T-shirt, <laughs> kind of a kind of a deal. You know, I mean, we we so often will go in like a bulldozer. Believing that the facts, the evidence, the science is enough. It should be enough. But if we're dealing with highly emotional creatures, including ourselves, it doesn't always work that way. I think Valerie. I, I love Valerie's example at a funeral. Thank you, Valerie. I, I do, too. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Daryl, you said defensive people don't change because defensive people don't listen. Right. This is true for atheists, too, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Come on, all atheists are rational. We're all enlightened. We're all smarter than everybody else, blah, blah, blah. We're not guilty of irrational thoughts or being defensive, are we? Well, the minute you get defensive, you're going to go into some kind of irrational mindset in almost all cases. Do we need to do a better job of being self-critical? I mean, you've examined the movement. What are your thoughts, any of you? Well, I, I think there's a lot of room for self-criticism in, in this. If you want to move to that area of being secular, we are knee-jerk in a lot of ways, and we don't turn the flashlight on ourselves in terms of our responses. And, and that's a problem, not just with 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 our relationships to religionists, but within our own community. Because I, I see people 
going off half cocked all the time and they don't listen to each other. And once they get into that defensive spiral, it goes downhill really quickly and it's almost impossible to get out of. It ruins relationships very quickly. I, I wish, I, I, if I could do a training session in the secular community, I would do a training session on how to resolve conflicts without Facebook. Pick up the well, phone and call somebody. <laughs> J.T. Eberhard conducted an experiment and he took a lot of heat for it, but he posted an egregiously false headline that played right into, I don't even remember the headline, but yeah. it was red meat for the atheist crowd. And then in the paragraph below the headline, he started by saying, the above headline is not true. This is all a falsehood. I've made it up. And he just spends the whole article saying, this is all crap. I, I pulled it out of my ass. It's not true. But so many people saw the headline and, I mean, by the order of tens upon tens of thousands, reposted it and said, yeah, so there. I mean, it's a reinforcement thing where we see an idea that reinforces what we already believe and we're eager to spread it even before we vetted it ourselves. It's something we are all guilty of. Religious people want to be right. And in fact, part of the appeal of religion, one of the ways that it kind of hooks us is because we all have this desire to kind of understand reality because, you know, I think it's hardwired because if we don't understand what's real and what are the contingencies governing our lives, we get whomped by the world, right? So that's one of those instincts or whatever you want to call it that Andy was talking about that religion hooks and then diverts or kind of repurposes. But it's not the only one by any means. And so if you have kind of atheists who are like, well, I'm right. I have found reality. And we kind of think that we can just, you know, kind of somehow that that in and of itself is sufficient, that we don't then need to kind of think about all of the other things that religion tries to do and what it means to replace those other things, like creating and fostering community, like providing channels for compassion and mutual support, like creating channels for wonder and a sense of transcendence or being part of something bigger than ourselves. If we kind of just say, oh, oh, we, we, we've now kind of corrected this one thing and we're kind of ignoring the whole rest of the package, I think we're kind of screwed. Valerie touches on what, again, I think is a major task of the secular community is how do we create community? How do we create a broader community? How do we maintain and expand bonds? How do we help people find the things that they had in religion in a secular life? Well, you know, some people will protest. I left one group, one herd. I'm not going to go and be a part of a community elsewhere. I'm no longer a sheep, right? I'm no longer thinking religiously. Therefore, I am going to be independent and an individual. So they'll say, I'm not going to a convention. I'm not going to a gathering. I'm not going to be a part of a secular meetup or a Sunday assembly or even drinks with atheists because I refuse to be another sheep as part of the herd. And I think we cheat ourselves in many instances, do we not? We are a communal species. Yeah, we really are. We're intensely social species, and I, I can understand why people take that stance of, you know, I'm, I'm going to be purely independent. But If you enjoy alone time that much, I get it. But rejecting social structures yes. with people of similar interest because you're just paranoid about looking religious, I think, is a cheat. Yes, but, but it also speaks to the kind of damage religion does. And, um, it, and it does. It damages people so much they don't right. don't get any close to any kind of community when, in fact, they need community. And I see this cool. pattern. I don't know if you've seen it, Valerie or Andy, that the people get out and they go through that really uh, rejectionist phase of any kind of organization. And then they get into, OK, maybe I do need some community, especially if they get married, especially if they have kids. You'll see that change. I don't Have you seen that? Yeah, I, I'll tell you a story that really shook me up. I was doing the ritual talk at a meeting and I had the audience you know, stand and sing Amazing Grace. And as soon as people sat down and did the, you know, checking their pain threshold and the other things, uh, a woman said, I had no idea of how upset I had made her that for her singing hymns was a trigger to all the trauma for her that religion had done to her in her in her life and i can't begin to describe how articulate she was i mean she just spoke up right there in the in my talk and it rattled me appropriately and then for several years afterwards i didn't have people sing amazing grace uh, i just had people sing happy birthday 
because she had told me uh, how much it had upset her. And she said, you've got to have other people in the audiences that you speak to who've been traumatized by religion and singing Amazing Grace is going to be a trigger to their distress and painful memories. And again, I think it, it shows when you run into people like Seth was describing who just you know want nothing to do with any group. I think that's an indirect measure of the degree to which religion is traumatized. We see in recovering from religion people people coming to us and coming to our small groups, and they're seeking relief from the they, they want to meet other people, but even as they're doing that, they're trying to create a new community. It's amazing they they leave church, they're pissed off at church, they're upset about being fooled all this time, and they want to meet other people who are just as pissed off <laughs> and and that it's cathartic, I think that's a big part of it, but within within a month or two, our meetings are monthly. Within a month or two or three, they're asking, where's the group? Where's another group I can go to? I love this, but I want a, I want a free thought group or an atheist group. And then we send them on to wherever they want to go. And I think the entire community, this is kind of my concept of what's going on in in secular world. We're seeing a sea change right now. I mean, the Sunday Assembly has grown rapidly. Oasis is a new phenomenon that's growing very rapidly. These are entire communities with... 100 to 200 people showing up every Sunday morning, and they don't look or act like churches to me. I've seen them. I don't think they're churches, but they're serving that community function that's so important to, I think, to mental health even, and especially when you're trying to get over the trauma mm-hmm. or something else. Having a group of supportive people around you who've had similar experiences really, I think it facilitates the mental recovery of people much faster than simply trying to get through it all by yourself or or with one or two other people. I find it exciting. I feel like we are in a grand experiment right now that there's been this kind of disruption in our social order, which is kind of like we've now kind of got enough of a challenge to traditional religious orthodoxies that people are, uh, there's all the kinds of things in motion. And I feel like people are trying to figure this thing out and there's going to be a whole bunch of experimental social processes at work. Sometimes there's going to get someone who gets triggered like Andy experienced. And there are people who get triggered by even the kind of very subtle hints of religiosity in Sunday assembly, for example, meaning like kind of the the structure of it triggers them. On the other hand, there are so many people coming out of religion right now that we know that a great number of them aren't just kind of solitary, kind of frontline people who can are willing to kind of stand in defiance of the entire social order. Instead, what we have now is a, a people who are much more communally oriented who are going to be doing all kinds of experiments to figure out what the next thing looks like. Andy, what do you think? Can I get the same high from singing John Lennon's Imagine that I do singing Amazing Grace as a religious person? Can I get that same kick? Well, I think it remains to be seen as something we need to investigate. I think the secular community would be helped by a little bit more singing and dancing, because I do think we have to find ways to create greater bonds. And and that's what religion does. And the Mm -hmm. religion is a, you know, if, you know, if you look at all those men praying in a mosque, that's a dance. Yeah. They're moving physically, they're moving synchronously. The music is the imams chanting, and that creates a powerful bond between those men that we know the neurotransmitters that are boosted. Now, will you get as much of a boost at the American Atheist singing John Lennon's song versus being at a Southern Baptist church singing Amazing Grace? I don't know. As I have Dr. Daryl Ray, Dr. Valerie Tirico, and Dr. Andy Thompson I'm going to ask kind of a tough question here, and I'd like each of you to weigh in if you would. If someone says, in relation to their God, specifically the Christian God, but any God who fits this context, I'm not worthy, right? I was born unworthy. I have a sin nature. God is so much smarter than me, I could never understand what he really wants. I must put my trust fully in him. He only allows harm to come to me for my own good, to build my character. He'll kill me if I move away. I have no other place to go. I really do love him. I just can't ever picture leaving him. This sounds to many suspiciously like the language of a battered spouse or battered partner. Do you see this as a legitimate comparison 
regarding religious belief in a God. I'm not worthy. I get my value from him. Any merit to that? Yes, I think it's a very good parallel. I agree. I'd second that. I, I, <laughs> you know, you could elaborate on that parallel to a great degree, but what, Andy, I forget what the term you used was to talk about a kind of super parent, basically, but I think in the same way you get this sort of dynamics of that can either be a pathological relationship or an abusive relationship, and then you get it kind of magnified at this sort of supernatural level. I think that's an excellent idea, Seth. I'd actually never seen that parallel between the psychology of a of an abused spouse. I mean, I can instantly think of one particular woman patient of mine who grew up Irish Catholic in New York City. And she just, as soon as you were saying that, she just returned to my memory because, you know, she really, I think, was battered by the Catholicism that she grew up with. Well, I'll qualify it by saying that many of the people that I've met who fit the profile have bought into a kind of a happiness structure. They they call it happiness. It's essentially a security of at least I'm with the evil I know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm with a familiar oppressor kind of a thing. And they say words and they use language that speaks to love. But ultimately, it's all about I'm not worthy. I can't. I shouldn't. I must rely on so-and-so for everything. And it just struck me. Daryl Ray, you want to weigh in on that at all? Yeah, I, you read something. I think I've read it before somewhere, but I've seen that comparison made many times. It's a very abusive relationship between you and your, your God. A friend of mine calls it a cultural coma. Now, I'm not sure it always fits, but if you think about it, people who are deeply infected with, especially a fairly fundamentalist religion, are asleep to lots of evidence and things going on around them. They simply can't see them. They're in a coma. And you can hit them upside the head with a two by four and they still can't see the evidence that this is an abusive, it's it's very abusive or it's harmful to their family or it's harm. I mean, if you look at, Valerie mentioned this earlier about the Seventh-day Adventists, those Seventh-day Adventists are knocking on your door every Saturday. Those people are not going out getting college degrees because Seventh-day Adventists discourage college education, seriously discourage college sure. Amish do the same things. You don't get anything above an eighth grade education. So the religion is really undermining the good of the individual in favor of the thriving of, of the religion itself. Now, does it's, the coma analogy, though, speak to how long it takes for many people to, quote unquote, wake up? Some people never wake up. Absolutely never. And I, they can't. I think we're going to learn sooner or later how this works. But right now, it just looks like when people get infected with certain things, as Andy talked about this right off the bat early on, it shuts down the capacity for certain kinds of reasoning and thinking and observation. So they're not even capable of it. And it may be, it may be a window. I, again, I'm not going to say I'm an expert here, but you know, there's a window for acquiring languages. Within that same window of acquiring languages is the same time we acquire religion. You get the religion your parents teach you or that's in your immediate culture, and you get the language that's in your immediate culture. So once you've got that, you're pretty well stuck with it. I mean, people who speak Chinese see the world differently than people who speak English. The languages actually frame our worldview, as Valerie talked about earlier. There's a lot of social construction there. Well, religion does the same thing. And once it's locked in there, sometimes it's, it's so deeply locked in, it's very difficult for people to come out of it. I'm not being hopeless. I'm not trying to be hopeless, but I see that as big. big well, I think, but I, I think what it points to is that the focus needs to be on the younger generation. Absolutely. I think, I think you have to at times realize that, you know, just like there's some viruses that kill and there's some cancers that kill, there are people, as Daryl just said, who are going to remain in a coma and die in a coma. And I think the focus needs to be on the younger generation where there is the window, where there is the opportunity. Right. One of my favorite essays, which I recommend to everybody, is Nicholas Humphrey's essay, What Shall We Tell the Children?, which is a, an address he gave to Amnesty International. It's now almost 20 years old, 1997. And he makes a very forceful argument that children have a fundamental right, a fundamental human right, to be protected from religious ideas. Yeah. And I read that, you know, maybe once a year and it always sort of reorients me and re-energizes me. And the one place I will get tough is when it comes to children. Um, there I will be argumentative and confrontational and 
your children have a right to be protected from this poison. And that's where I, I think we're getting to a point where you, which I think is nice, where you're not going to be able to have an introductory textbook to psychology 101 in high school or psychology 101, you know, your senior year of high school that doesn't include the new knowledge about the psychology of religious belief. Well, I sure hope we get there soon. I love that. Yeah, I mean, the sooner the better, but I think it's going to be hard because so much of this is coming out, even, you know, from research psychologists that I think a textbook is going to have to include it to be seen as legitimate. Dr. Tarico, any final thoughts here? You know, if we're having a conversation, we're teaching people about kind of normal human psychology and we're not talking about religion, we are having an as-if conversation. And if we are not actively engaged in kind of rigorous scientific research to understand the transmission of religion and how religion affects and shapes the person's kind of worldview and emotions and such, then it's like this huge gap in our understanding of what it means to be a human being. Dr. Daryl Ray, Dr. Randy Thompson, Dr. Valerie Tarico. any final thoughts on, you know, the brain, psychology, religious belief, our fight against irrationality in the lives of others and in our own minds? Anything you want to sort of cap the conversation with? I'll start with you, Daryl Ray. What do you think? Well, I want to go back to something Andy said about, and we've been talking off and on about community. I think, uh, and I've been saying this for the last few years, and I, and, I've, and other people are too. I'm not going to say I'm the only one, but you don't have community until you got children. It's that simple. I go to all these meetups, I talk around the country, and I see a lot of adults. I don't see many children a lot of times. And I'm everywhere I go, I say, you've got to get children involved. You've got to get child care. You've got to get babysitting. You've got to do something. Because until you've got families involved, we haven't got the next generation. And that's an area I think we've not done too well in the past. I am seeing it improve dramatically with Oasis and Sunday Assembly. I'm seeing some meetups doing things like that. So I think Andy's totally right. We need to focus on the youngest, the youngest, the most vulnerable. Families are leaving religion, and they want to take their children somewhere. And they're sending their children to school, and the kids are saying, you're going to go to hell because you don't believe in the God that I believe in. The parents want to have some place to take their kids to get inoculated to that kind of stuff they're having to deal with in elementary school. Well, that's where organizations like Camp Quest come yes. into play, I would suppose. Yes, it does. Absolutely. It's a great organization. Dr. Tarico, anything? We know that there are people who are at best very marginally religious or haven't thought about it in a decade who end up sucked back into religion because they want some kind of community for their children. They want a place to kind of teach their children about values. They want to have that kind of sense of shared social, emotional kind of resonance and support. So if we're not figuring out how to create that, we're actively taking young people who are on their way out of religion and sending them back in. Right. Dr. Andy Thompson? Just uh, thank you to you, Seth, for inviting me to Valerie and Daryl and to read Daryl's books. One thing we didn't touch on was the degree to which religion poises intimate life and sexuality. And I think Daryl's book is important there and and needs to be more widely known. And uh, I I do think Valerie's right. We are at an unusual time in our history. You know, when I'm, I'm old enough that I remember when there were no books like the ones that are now available on religion and the psychology of religion and I think this is all just very nice. This is what I do, Andy. I just bring smart people on the radio, and then I just Mm -hmm. ask them questions and sit mute in the corner and take credit Uh, for everything they do and say. (laughs) Well, you you deserve some credit. A lot uh, of credit. Don't tell us you're not smart. Surround yourself with smart people, and, you know, people might think you're smart. I don't know. Go figure. I'm going to include uh, (laughs) links to all of your resources, books, to your websites and whatnot, to make sure that our listeners can easily find those resources, because they are certainly worthy ones for your work out there on the front lines of free thought for helping us better understand know what religion is and how it works in the mind and how we might best address it and for being on the radio tonight i say thank you it's been a real pleasure much appreciated thank you for having me likewise follow the thinking atheist on facebook and twitter watch dozens of original videos on the thinking atheist youtube channel and visit our website for resources links contact information the editor's blog and more thethinkingatheist.com